So good afternoon, everyone, uh, to both those of you uh, in the room and those of you watching the webcast online. Uh, welcome to uh, the next edition of the RAL seminar series. Uh, so today's speaker is Dr. Wangda Zuo, okay, uh, who has a, a dual appointment with Penn State University and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So Dr. Zuo is a professor in architectural engineering and the Associate Director for Research of Global Building Network, which is an initiative of Penn State and the United Nations on high performance buildings. Dr. Zuo also holds a joint appointment in the Communities and Urban Science Group at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, which uh, most of us here know well, and was a former scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or LBNL. He is currently an Associate Editor for the Journal of Solar Energy Engineering and Treasurer of International Building Performance Simulation Association, IPBSA. Dr. Zuo is the recipient of IBPSA Fellow, ASCE Exceed Fellowship, IBPSA USA Emerging Professional Award, Eliehu won, Jur or Eliehu I Jury Early Career Research Award, and ASHRAE Distinguished Service Award. He is a major contributor to multiple open source building and community engineering and energy modeling tools, including LBNL's Modelica Buildings Library and NREL's Urban Opt. And so for those of you in the room, um, we'll, we can ask questions at the end as well. And if you're online, uh, enter questions uh, either during the talk or after the talk in Slido. Uh, that should be viewable uh, just if you scroll down the webpage uh, just below the, uh, the webcast video. So Wanda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jared. Um, can you hear me from on? Okay, okay. Yeah, um, really, it's, uh, it's my honor to uh, visit uh, Anka. So um, I have been living in Boulder for almost five years and so, uh, since I was a uh, faculty at the CEO Boulder and just recently joined Penn State. So, so glad to visit Anka before I moved to uh, Pennsylvania. And so um, today I would like to discuss some of our research uh, in modeling uh, sustainable resilient cities. The, the purpose is really trying to uh, you know, bring our research to the Anka scientists to see if how we can work together. So as you can see, I really trying to show what we need from your side. So I'm a customer coming to, come to you. Okay, so um, first uh, I will um, briefly discuss uh, why we want to model um, cities and what kind of modeling uh, approach we're taking. And then I will focus my presentation on the opportunities I see for the weather and the climate predictions, how uh, we can work together. So um, by doing that, I will show you some of our current or previous projects, and then you can see the opportunities that how we can you know, make a, you know, a dream team working together. At the end, I will make a short conclusion. So uh, as you know, uh, buildings really in the US counts um, a lot of um, Things like, for example, people spend the most time indoor. Um, then buildings use about more than 40 percentage primary energy, and more than 70 percentage of electricity, and also responsible for 40 percentage of CO2 emissions in the U.S. So, the thing about the future uh, is really the cities, because more and more people are moving to the cities. Uh, according to United Nations, in 2050, more than 70 percent of people is going to live in the cities. And our city will also be the engine of our economics because more than 80 percentage of gross GDP will come from city. However, city will also need about 70 percent of energy and responsible for more than 70 percent of CO2 emission. So as you can see, this, the cities create a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of challenges for us. Um, so in the past, the people really worked on you know, integrate uh, climate prediction with building energy modeling. So this is a, a review paper I found. So as we can see that you know, um, the different way to couple the climate prediction with building energy modeling varies from the uh, street, neighborhood, to the city scale. And so also uh, the right figure shows the current uh, work you know, cited by this uh, literature review paper. So um, on, okay, let me use my mouse. Okay, so this side is really the different building energy modeling tools. So what I want to say that so those tools are really designed to simulate annual building energy performance. So they can see the more like a cozy steady state, how building is going to use energy you know, with different outdoor climates. 
Um, so the things are changing you know, since this is the paper was done two years ago. The tools are developed 10, 20 years ago. So because the modern buildings is not just owning an energy consumer, but there's a lot of other things get involved. So this is our view of the modern buildings. So it, it becomes an integrated complex system or called cyber-physical and social systems, or CPSS. So what happens is if you look at uh, a building on the left figure here, so now it's not only building envelope, right? So we also have the HVAC, lighting, control, advanced appliance, advanced thermal storage, mainly difference is uh, security integrated together. And then recently, just a few years ago, the, the Department of Energy is trying to push another thing we call the building to grid integration, as you can see on the right figure. So the idea is that building is not only a consumer of energy, but also a producer of energy because the renewable energy installed on, on, on the building, like the PVs. And in addition, building wants to be actively participating in the electrical market, provide a service to the power grid. So now you can see the building's role is becoming more active. That raises significant challenges for the building modeler, but also opportunities for the climate predictors. Uh, so that's why you can see within the buildings really varies a lot on spatial, temporal, and the physical diversities, and on the continuous interaction of human and the nature. Um, so there's a lot of work ongoing with human. We study occupant behavior, but I feel that's more opportunity can come from nature side. If you look at our city, city is really an integrated system of many multiple CPSS, including energy, transportation, and other systems. They're intertwined with each other. Again, they are on the continuous interaction of human and the nature. So to address these complex systems, we took a different approach. So um, here we use an equation-based modeling uh, language called Modelica. So this is a language designed to model multi-domain, multi-physical systems. So the Modelica language was originally developed in 1996. And since then, there's a lot of development going. And so we have three major free standard libraries uh, with more than 2,000 models. So those mod so Modelica, uh, the, the models can be used for aerospace industry, automotive industry, power plants, even can, can model the blood in the human body. So because it's just equation-based language. Uh, there are more than 100 free and commercial libraries. In the buildings industry, there are four major free libraries. So one is the Modelica Buildings Library, developed by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So we started development uh, almost 12 years ago. Um, so since then, my team continue working with LBL on the development. The major uh, advantage of Modelica is called a separation of concerns. So the idea is that to do the physical modeling, we, we need to do it by human. As you can see, for example, we have a Work here. So if you want to study heat transfer, we can use the equations to describe the heat transfer phenomena. Or we can use a diagram um, to you know, like the, the storage and conductor to describe that. Or we can use algorithms. So all this is done by human, but using high-level descriptive language. And after that, so we can use the computer software to automatically generate the C code. So here, no people need to write the codes. And so that also did involve of mathematic operations to reduce the complexity of the equation systems. Then we can generate uh, the codes for simulation, optimization, and embedded computing. So since 2010, uh, LBL is also with support of DOE, and then later on with many other national labs, uh, they developed a lot of Modelica models. Now the Modelica models are served as engine of DOE's next generation beauty energy modeling tool. And all, as well as the community modeling tool. So specifically in my lab, besides develop the open source library for um, DOE, we also develop different Modelica models to address different application problems. Um, so those models can vary from component like a heat exchanger or a pump, all the way to building, to community, and to city scale. So uh, next, I will, I will focus my talk on the application side. I, I want to see, uh, also get your inputs on how we can work together to address those application problems. I will start uh, with a um, net zero energy community project we did in Florida. So um, this is a 
community on an island called Anna Maria Island, as you can see, is uh, near Tampas in the Gulf of Mexico. So the community was uh, established in 2012. So it has five commercial radiation buildings mixed together. As you can see, they have PV installed on the rooftop and also they have PV covered um, parking lots. Um, so my team has been working with them since 2015. We, we just visited them last month. And so they have detailed metering system for their energy generation and consumption. We also installed a local weather station um, at this community. So now what is the application problem? So this figure shows the net energy usage and production of this community. So the, the blue color indicates the community produces more energy on site than it consumes. Therefore, it exports energy to the power grid. The, the salmon pink color indicates the renewable energy on site is not enough. Then therefore, it has to import or buy energy from the power grids. Uh, so this community is connected to the power grids. Okay, so the definition of a net zero energy community is that in an annual base, the energy consumed on site is, you know, is equal or less than the renewable energy produced on site. So that means during the day, you can produce more energy. At night, you will buy energy from the grids. That's the idea. Um, as also, you can see in the real world project, since it's not uh, static, for example, when they when started, OK, this solid line indicates the accumulated energy you know, from generation minus the um, consum uh, consumption. You can see it initially is a little bit negative. By then, in 2012, they ate the PV on the parking pots. Then they get a lot of generation, then pump up the total uh, energy. And then in October of 2012, a battery moved in. That's used a lot of energy, uh, you know, electrical oven and others. And then they added more PV in 2013. Then another building opened in, 20, in the July of 2013. You see, things is changing because of seasonal impact. And then in 2015, a general store moved in. They have very nice on-site coffee, but use a lot of, you know, electricity. So that, that's the reality. Then also from the cost side, the Florida Power and Light, which is a utility, provide electricity to this community. They have the, the pricing scheme for them that, number one, they charge the electricity use is KWH. Because you, know, you are the net zero energy community, at the end of the year, you really don't get pay anything for that. Because, right, so, um, but the utility has to maintain all the infrastructure to support you, right? Especially at, at the night, you have some peak loads. They have to set up everything. All the capacity has to sit in there. Then from the business point of view, they have to charge for all the capacity. So then they call it peak demand charge. So that's the half hour, highest half hour of the entire year is the capacity they have to reserve for this community. So that's how they charge the community. Now, from the owner's point of view, you have a choice, right? So what you can do? Do you want to reduce your peak demand? So you can either add more battery, add more PV, or try to cut your energy consumption, right? So so many options you can do to reduce your peak demand. Or you can potentially see if, you know, especially now you have more uh, customers move in, you use more energy, now you're not net zero energy any anymore. So should you add more PV? Is that cost-wise? So a lot of unknowns, they, so we use the model to help them to, ans to answer these questions. So this is what we did. Uh, first, I want to show you the system schematic of this community. As you can see, so they have the PV here, PV system, then they have the buildings. They also have the ground source heat pump systems. So you, they use ground water as a source for uh, cooling most time, but sometimes heating you know, in a few days of Florida. And then they have the also domestic hot water um, using the PV, and then they have electrical um, water heater as a backup. So that, that's how the system is formed. Then the right-hand side shows the um, top-level system model we built in Mandelica. So all the models are open source released at our, at our live website. So let me just show you the PV model. So this is our system. Uh, we use a hierarchy approach to build a system. So if you open 
this PV icon, now you can see we have eight PV subsystems built here. And then if you open this one, then you can see the, the PV subsystem on one building. And then if you open further this one, now you can see individual panel. So then here we have the, this is our weather port, which gets the solar irradiant information, and then we can calculate the electricity produced by individual panel. And then we can use that information to calibrate our panel, and then after that we package it, then we can calibrate our subsystem, again package it, then come to our entire PV systems. So this is our validation results of the PV model. Um, we, we compare the prediction uh, data with our measured data. In general, you can see they match with each other very well. However, they do have some issues. As you can see, for example, sometimes the model over predict right, the peak um, production, but sometimes under predict, right, if you see this day. Right, so then we try to understand what's going on with that because the PV model is relatively simple. And then what we found that, because in our study, we used the nearby weather station, uh, we use MI data from nearby weather station, but on island, there's a lot of cloud movements. And so that significantly impact our prediction. So our solution is simple. <laughs> we just installed a uh, reading sensor there, cost us $10,000, but we got good data. Uh, so then we use this data, we can calibrate our model, get confidence on our model. So after that, we have a virtual test bed, then we can study, okay, how can we use you know, the community to study the advanced control, for example, if uh, more and more their energy community is deployed in the US. So this is a joint project with the Pacific Northwestern National Lab and the Oak Ridge National Lab. So the idea is that we build a model, we perform the model-based optimization, trying to cut the peak demand to save the cost for the community. And so the right figure shows the results. Uh, as you, I just explained the results. As you can see, uh, if it's below zero, that means we cut the power consumption compared to my baseline, which I don't have advanced control. Uh, and then if it's above zero, that means I use more energy. So apparently at the night, when there's no sun, I cut my power. Uh, consumption. Uh, then, when in you know, a day when the sun comes out, we have, when I have a lot of on-site generation, I can use more um, electricity to do pre-cooling for my buildings. So that you know, especially when when the sun is down, so I can significantly cut my consumptions. So if you ever you know California, that's famous called a dark curve. That, that's when the sun is down, when the load is up, significantly ramp up. So that's a critical time if you can cut the loads for the grids. Um, so this work, I would say, we use perfect weather data, historic data. But in the reality, that's a significant challenge. For example, if, first, if we want to optimize the sizing of our, my community, for example, the battery, the PV, I need to know the local climate for the next 10, 20 years so that I can make informed decision because it's critical economic decision. And also, if I want to do my control to provide demand response, then I need to know the weather prediction, right? Is that clouds going to come? Even I predict I'm able to produce a lot of electricity using my PV in the late afternoon. But unfortunately, if the cloud is coming, I cannot. Then I have to pay penalty because of peak demand charge. So that's a very interesting problem that we don't know. And I'm looking for help here. <laughs> OK, so let's move to the next one. Uh, so this is an interesting, another interesting project on the, the resilient coast cities. Um, so yeah, we have an NSF project um, when I was in Miami. So the idea is that can we develop engineering solutions for our coast city, especially, you can see hurricanes is more and more frequently. So the, it's very common that we have no power after hurricane. Even the hurricane did not, did not directly hit our city. But you know, the edge of the wind will blow the trees, then damage the power transmission lines. So this is a real example. Uh, again, I use the net zero energy community as example. So after 2017 hurricane Emma, the entire island had a power outage for more than 10 days. Just trees down. So the, the hurricane did not damage the infrastructure, but the trees is down. And as you can see now, my community is 
off grid. I have no connection to power, power grid. Unfortunately, I cannot operate this community because it was designed to connect to the grids using the power grid as my virtual battery. Now the question to the owner is that how I'm going to improve the resiliency of my community so that I can operate my community even if it is off grids. Think about the island. So this community, they have a general store which provides the food. That can be critical during or after disaster, the food supply, right? So when I visited them last month, they're talking about purchasing diesel generator as a backup. Uh, you know, if you want to promote sustainability, you try to avoid this generator, right? We say, oh, can we do battery? Then the question is, how much battery we need? <laughs> Right, so that I can meet all the critical loads. So doing this work, um, yeah, we, we did a uh, study to study how we can design the system um, to control the system when the system is running off grids. Here we use a hierarchy approach that you can see we divide the entire control into two layers. So first, every building has a building control layer that decides the energy usage of my individual building. What is the most critical needs? Right? And then we aggregate all the needs sent to the community operator layer. So the community operator layer will decide, okay, this is my total needs. And I can divide those needs into critical, flexible, shitable, and then this is my predicted generation, and this is my battery storage. So then how I'm going to allocate the resources. Um, here, as you can see, the critical input for this decision-making process, one is PV generation, we need a sun, <laughs> and another one is what is, will be outdoor temperature and the solar irradiance, that impacts my cooling loads. Um, so that's some of the results. Uh, first figure shows the um, community in the normal operation. As you can see, we use a lot of energy during the day because a lot of activity ongoing. Um, but in the disaster operation mode, I don't have the power grid as my backup. I only have limited generation and the battery. So I have to significantly cut my consumption. So here we use the concept, you know, we divide the loads into critical loads. For example, the, the lighting and the refrigerator, we consider critical loads. And then the multiple loads is our, um, for example, our air conditioning and our food processor. The shift loads is the washer, dryer, or dishwasher. And the shareable loads is the you know, TV or coffee maker. So um, in the disaster mode, we will try everything to meet the critical loads. For example, the food has to be refrigerated, otherwise we cannot eat them anymore. And then we will you know, use that energy for the, um, in this case, is the multiple loads, which is ready for um, um, air conditioning. Because it's too hot, people are going to die. Right, so it happened, the tragedy happened to some community in Florida. It's, I think the, one of the senior living house, when that, after the hurricane, when there's no power, you know, some people unfortunately died because it's extremely hot and humid there. Um, so the question here is that if we can increase the size of battery, then we can meet more loads. But of course, it's come with a cost, just like our insurance. Right? I can buy the basic insurance for my car, but it was of the money. When you come to real world, that's a calculation you have to do. And then another tricky part, so in the previous work, we only consider, you know, everything is nicely controlled. And the temperature is set by my system. But in the reality, people is going to change the set points. Like, right, I often overwrite the nest thermostat at my home. Um, so how you design and control when you ca to consider those uncertainty of human behavior, that's going to change Right, how much energy you should reserve. So then we developed another uh, work trying to inc incorporate the uncertainty from the occupant behavior. Okay, so until this work, I, as you can see now, I never talk about the weather. <laughs> I never talk, so all the things I use, again, is the MY data. So I have perfect prediction of my weather. So that's the opportunity I see you know, to working with you know, people here. Um, so can we develop really new resilient community control with uncertainty in the weather prediction, right? So, and also another one is that how I'm going to size my battery PVs based on the prediction of the future extreme climates for those communities. Because using the, you know, in our industry, 
we typically use TMI data, that's you know, average data in the past, right? But that's not gonna work as we know the cl climate change is happening. Uh, the weather is totally different this year compared to the past years. And so we need better prediction so that we can de design our system correctly. Okay, next, uh, let me talk about another ongoing project. So this is even bigger scale. So the idea that we want to make our uh, an energy system become a comprehensive system by integrate microgrids, district cooling, district heating with renewable energy. Uh, we also have the combined heat and power, or CHP, to as a backup to provide a critical supply. So this is a, a recent project um, we got a few years, uh, two years ago. I, I was a PI of the project, then I, we transferred the PI to my colleague when I moved to Penn State. So um, the focus of this project is to develop tools to support the design operation of such, uh, we call the great interactive efficient district energy systems. As you can see, now we have renewable energy generation, storage, buildings, and different forms of energy connect together. And in a normal time, we can import energy from the power grids, right? So then our goal is to improve the efficiency of our systems. And but to do that, I need to predict my climates so that I can decide how I'm going to retrofit my system or how I'm going to develop or control. So based on, for example, the, based on the weight of temperature. And then another thing is for the resilient scenario. So our goal is trying to uh, make our improve the continuous operation hours of our system in the off-grid mode. But that really significant impact by the extreme weather, right? So how cold it's going to be in the cold winter of um, Boulder or how hot it's going to be in the summer. That's the most likely the thing's going to happen, the bad thing's going to happen to our, our power grids. Um, so that's something we don't know. So again, we need help um, from people here. And here I want to show you some results we did for the system efficiency. So this is a recent work um, my uh, student did for CO Boulder using CO Boulder campus as example. So the idea is trying to improve the control of the um, district cooling system. We use the Williams Village, uh, which is student um, dorm with multiple buildings um, as example. So. Um, the, the, the key, I, the, the process that we identify the problem, we go to the side, we collect all the data, then we calibrate the model, and then after we build the model, then we, we deploy the, okay, we validate the model with the measured data, and then we perform optimization and trying to see how can we reduce the cost, and also CO2 emission and others. So as you can see, energy, cost, carbon emission are all in the consideration of this study. And so, I, and, and then we get about, 15% saving in energy, about 9% saving in cost because it involves the dynamic pricing. It's not just constant price for the electricity. And also 15% um, saving about uh, cutting in the CO2 emissions. So in this work, um, one thing we did is that is to, uh, to, set, to find an optimal control set point for my cooling tower. So the, the water uh, the, leaving the cooling tower sent to my chiller. So that temperature can be adjusted based on the predicted uh, weight bulb temperature. Um, so, that, so in this project, we use historical weather data, MY data. But we would, you know, really, it would be great if we can use the future you know, um, weight bulb temperature data for, for, for this kind of work so that it can be redeployed to the site. Okay, so, and, yeah, since I discussed carbon emission reduction, I want to discuss more on that. Um, so the common question, you know, we often ask that, does reduce energy consumption have the same effect in reducing CO2 emission? I think in my previous talk, maybe give a little bit hints. So the answer is no. It's because the composition of CO2 emission in our electricity generation varies. So if you look at these two figures, the left figure shows the composition of electricity generation in the US at different locations. Let's use Stanford as an example. Nowadays, 33% of electricity comes from coal. And then 30% um, 30, 
percentage come from natural gas, 28 come from wind, five from the PV. But if you look at, let's say, grid force, nearly 64% come from hydro dam, and 32 come from wind, only 3% come from coal. So they have much clean energy than us. And then, the, so the arrow point to this 2050, the projection, and as you can know, uh, as you know that you know the utilities are also trying to deploy more renewable energy, like say again, use them for example. Now in 2050, the energy is only 18 percent coming from the coal. So, but we have more energy coming from the wind comes for 45 percent, and 25 is coming from the PV. So you can see it's changing. And also the right figure shows another interesting phenomenon. Oh, sorry, is the Time. So um, the horizontal line is the day of the year from day one to 365. The vertical line shows the hour from zero to 24. And the color indicates the CO2 emission intensity of the electricity generation. Uh, so using 2022 example, as you can see, a lot of time during the day is light. That means there's a lot of renewable energy kick in, so therefore energy is really clean. But at night, it's more darker because we have to keep using the fossil fuel as energy supply. And this trend is changing from 2022 to 2046 because you know, the penetration of renewable energy. So therefore, it actually provides opportunity as for, the, for us to control our buildings so that we can use more energy when they're green and less energy when they're darker. Right? So, that's a different way of control the building. In the past, we always think about the peak demand, we think about the cost, but we can also design or control our building to reduce CO2 emission. Yeah, so um, we recently started another uh, project together with Ireland, it's supported by NSF and also Irish government, to do large scale analysis um, for our building energy policy so that we are able to reduce the CO2 emission in large scale. Um, yes, here is our uh, some of initial results. First, we studied the future electricity generation uh, at five different scenarios. Um, so the first one is called a high renewable cost. That means, you know, probably not many renewable energy can be deployed because cost too high. Uh, and then we have the mid uh, mid scenario, not just as it is right now, or all the way to the low renewable energy cost. That means renewable energy becomes so cheap, then we can deploy a lot of renewable energy at a faster pace. So in different scenario at different cities, and uh, you can see the energy composition or CO2 emission will be totally different. Then we apply that, and then we try. We have different way to improve our building energy efficiency. We call it building retrofit measures. And we found, yeah, at different locations, you get different effects. And the general pattern is that, so when the time goes from now to 2050, the CO2 reduction potential for building energy efficiency measure is reducing. So even you reduce the same amount of energy because energy becomes greener, therefore the amount of CO2 you're able to reduce becomes less. Right? So um, but using different measures, we have different effects, and also at different locations, you get different achievements in terms of reduction. So that will, um, in, in, these two, in these cases, you can see that the prediction of future climate is very important. That determines the renewable energy generation, right? So how much you can get from renewable. And then the other thing is that the future climate will impact the building energy consumption that also impact your total CO2 reduction potential. Um, we also did another interesting work, which is to, can we just operate our community to minimize the CO2 emission? So this is a joint uh, research with uh, Unreal team. Um, so we identified a community in Colorado. Um, then you can see this community, they have 27 units. The idea is that can we develop a simple control that if we know the CO2 intensity in electricity so that we can intentionally control my energy consumption to reduce the CO2 emission. So this is our results. As you can see, um, because we designed the control like that, so that therefore we are able to reduce the CO2 emission by 6 to 20 percentage uh, compared to the baseline. Uh, but the interesting question is that, that 
the cost does not necessarily reduce. Um, it, it sometimes we even cost more because right, right now CO2 is not tied to the cost. Again, for this control, we see interesting problem. First, how can we operate a system to reduce CO2 emission and the cost at the same time? Right, so that's how you're going to be able to do large-scale deployment if you're able to save the cost for the building owners. And then another question, how much energy does it need and can it you know, generate on site in the next X hours, one hour or eight hours, that can impact my control decision. And then also, when should I import energy from the grids? And how much should I import? There's a lot of questions we don't know. Uh, we, we need also know the boundary condition, that's climate or weather prediction. And then for the design and the uh, retrofit, again, what kind of investment options we have? So in what capacity we should invest, for example, energy efficiency, improve the window, insulation, or have more efficient <coughs> HVAC system, or put a more renewable energy generation, or add a battery, and how much we should we add? And that's the future climates will become a very important factor in this decision-making process. And of course, then plus the price of electricity, right? A lot of things has to be considered. Okay, so the next, um, I want to mention another interesting project. So this is not written modeling, but it's really interesting. Um, so this is, is a project I'm working on right now um, with Indonesia. And so um, as you can see, the left is a typical alley in Indonesia, the city called Makassar City. And the right is they call it Garden Alley. So the city is trying to improve the environment of the residents by doing the Garden Alley projects. So what are we trying to do is to, using the sensor network, and to collect the environmental data, to understand the effect of the Garden Alley, and then using the machine learning to process the data we collected so that we can find the patterns of those garden alley. And also I want to mention that not every garden alley project are successful, some are not. So we are also trying to figure out why. And then those information can be provided to the city government because they have 7,000 alleys in the city. And if they want to do large scale massive deployment, they need to understand, right? They need to have a informed decisions. So what we did is we build the sensor um, to collect data, environmental data, uh, for example, um, the temperature, solar irradiance, and the SO2, O3, and then we also did a survey to the local residents to understand you know, their perspective about the garden alley. After that, we put the data into our machine learning model and we hopefully to understand how we can you know, adjust our inputs to get the best output from the growth of edible plants or non-edible plants. Um, as you can see here, again, the weather is very important for this project. Um, so, and also we understand the local climates, like the wind, how we can also address the pollution problem of the city. Yeah, so next week, actually, the, the, the mayor of the city is gonna lead uh, 30 people come to DC for our project. So we're gonna have big project meeting at NSF. Okay, so um, next I wanna make a very short conclusion. So as we have discussed, the sustainable resilient cities are crucial in the battle of climate change. You can see different projects ongoing, DOE, NSF, and many other agencies trying to support research in this area. Um, during the research, we do realize that localized climate and the very prediction are much needed for those optimal design and operation of our sustainable smart cities, uh, which we are not an expert on that. So therefore, I believe we need to work together to develop uh, robust solutions for the climate change. Um, so for example, probably many of you know, that recently DOE has an urban integrated field laboratory, and I also participate in one of the teams. I, I can see you know, more opportunity coming that we can work together to address the problem together. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Wangda. That was a fascinating seminar. 
Um, so while we wait for questions to come in uh, online from Slido, and those of you on the webcast, please do put in your questions on Slido. Um, I guess I'll ask the first question. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things to ask about here, but I think um, you're, you're obviously using you know, perfect, perfect weather data as input. So using, you know, if we had real forecast data, that would include errors, obviously. I guess, what are the, what do you see as being the, the opportunities and risks for, uh, for the performance of your, of these models here for incorporating actual forecast data where you have to make decisions on how to, how to manage the loads and how to kind of plan that, but then the forecast might be off, either you know, high or low on, on the irradiance and therefore how much solar energy is getting generated or wind power if it's, you know, if you have that accessible. But thinking even just of the Anna Maria Island, uh, that, that green city example, I guess, what do you, what, what do you see as the, the opportunities and risks there? Yeah. Um, this is a very good question. So as an uh, engineer, we are dealing with uncertainty, unknowns all the time, right? We design a system, really can see the safety factor for things we don't know. Um, so as, as we can see, was discussed earlier, for example, you know, in our current work, we consider occupants uncertainty, right? That's another big thing we don't know. Um, so we have to add those safety factor in, into our system design. Um, so we, in some of our project, we did use the weather forecast, but again, we just treated that data as perfect predicted. <laughs> we did not consider uncertainty. Um, we do need the expert like you to tell us what is the range, right? And we don't know 5%, 10%, we don't know what to say properly because that is gonna significantly impact our control and the performance of our systems. Yeah, and, and the, um, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the forecast error is obviously changes a lot through time and depending on what, what parameter you're looking at and all that. Um, next though, we can maybe come back to that a little bit mm -hmm. later. I wanna ask, uh, Fei Chen has a question from Slido, so I'll just read it. Mm -hmm. uh, Fei writes, interesting work. What is the potential of using electric vehicles to reduce CO2 emissions in densely populated cities? How can your building energy models be applied to weather and climate models that use spatial scales of a few kilometers to 100 kilometers? Yes, yeah, this is a very good question. Um, yeah, okay, I actually, uh, give me a second. Um, yeah, I have another, I didn't show it here, but I, I can show you. That's another NSF project we did, so um, that perfect address your question. Give me a second. Okay, yeah, so that's the slides I actually, I didn't show, <laughs> I showed part of this. Um, yeah, so we have actually another NSF project on the Smart Connect community. Um, so this project is to integrate transportation. Uh, as you can see from the right figure, we assume the future transportation is 100 percentage electrical vehicle. Uh, so, and also all the cars are Tesla style that you can auto automatically drive, but you will need a lot of interactions between your electric vehicle to the energy grids because charge, right, is huge demands. And also we envision the future EV can also discharge, served as a battery for my power grids. And then my energy is not only buildings, but also my, um, storage generation, everything tied together, and with, we integrate the, con um, the communication network because all the distributed energy network needs communication to organize so that we can carefully manage our energy uh, consumptions or, or generations. So the goal for this project is say, we, we envision the future community will be zero traffic for transportation, zero outage, for the energy network because it's already 100% renewable, and then zero congestion for the communication. Yeah, so then we also built the model to integrate all the three networks together and also it's publicly released. Yeah, now come back to the integration here. So for example, if you open the, you can see here we have roads, communication, and the power cable connected. And then if you open this 
community block, you can see energy, communication, and transportation, and then for energy of supply demands. Um, so in that case, we are able to couple them together to understand, for example, the move of the EVs from one community to the other ones. Yeah, and then I want to show the case study that answer your questions. Here we have three communities, uh, assume them in San Francisco, and two are residential, one is commercial. We have one scenario, only energy. Second scenario, energy plus transportation. And the third one, we couple energy, transportation, and the communication. So you see the results. So the first one, it shows the power from the grids, how much power we need to take. Here it's not there, it's not a net zero energy. I still need a lot of electricity from the grids. So what do you see the peak? In the early peak, if I do not consider transportation, communication, I have a higher peak than when I consider transportation and communication. So the reason is that if I consider transportation, in the morning peak hours, my EVs are more likely stuck on the traffic than charging at the stations. So therefore, I have less peak, <laughs> right? And that's, right, that's how you see when the systems start to integrate together. Another interesting here. So this one, we, com we compare the velocity of the vehicle on the roads. The solid line is the speed of my car from residential to commercial. And as you can see, of course, it drops around 8 o'clock. That's my morning rush hour, pre-COVID. Right? Um, then the dash line is the speed from the commercial to residential when people come home. Then we have another speed drop. Um, interestingly enough, here, when you consider communication, as mentioned, I assume all of my EVs are unmanned electrical vehicle. It needs a lot of wireless communication. So, but if everyone needs communication, then I'm stuck. So I have to slow down, make sure I get enough information on where I go. So then you can see, when you consider communication, congestion, your speed further slows down. Right, so that's, yeah, that's what happens. And the weather also plays an important role. Here, I assume perfect weather. <laughs> so if you consider all the other bad weather, your traffic will slow down further. Right? Your generation will change. Um, you may have some disruption of your communication. So we, we do build the platform that allow us to integrate the weather into the study. Yeah, that's a, yeah, thanks for that. That's a fascinating, fascinating concept to consider as well that you're managing all the autonomous vehicles and their speeds and, and how that can modulate um, on the grid, because I would think also part, so did you consider with this, with the EVs serving as basically, you know, able to charge and discharge back into the grid, uh, that you know, when people are at work, they're often not plugged in, but when they're at home, they are. And so there tend to be maybe, well, this may also change in the, the COVID hybrid, <laughs> hybrid work uh, um, world where maybe where more people are at home and therefore have their cars plugged in kind of all day. Um, I guess, have you thought of how, how that, how those dynamics might be impacting uh, even these results and the, the ability of using EVs as a battery for the grid to discharge into it? Yeah, I think this is a very good um, point. So uh, currently, we do, we do not consider yet. So I would say that our folks right now is really focused on building the models. And as you can say, you know, we would like to work with the people who, uh, for example, transportation expert, who, trying to, who, who is studying the behavior of people's charging, discharging, right? Driving patterns. Uh, I feel, you know, I'm more, you know, I can focus on my model, but I really cannot cover every <laughs> domain. Uh, so we have a couple more questions coming in from online. So the first one is from Lu Lin. Uh, Lu Lin says, nice talk, Wangda. How sensitive are many of your results to the frequency of the weather information as inputs? For instance, will a forecast with 15-minute updates in temperature, wind, and solar radiation be better than one with hourly or three-hourly updates for your applications? 
this is a very good question. I, I think that depends on the applications. So I would say, for example, for building uh, loads, typically 15 minutes to one hour is sufficient because you won't change that much. But if you talk about PV, that's important. So um, five to 10 minutes is sometimes become critical, especially if you want to do peak demand reduction. Uh, so uh, uh, in general, I would say that we will need to really, you know, uh, for example, if you do sizing, that's, you know, hourly is fine, right? Because it really just impact the size, but controls, you, you need to be more frequently. Uh, and also one thing we, we could do together is that I understand from Jerry's point of view, also maybe when you predict what happened to, tomorrow is more difficult. Right, and then the prediction gets better and better when the time right closer, and that actually can be integrated into our building control, right? So that we can adjust dynamically, so that we know next hour exactly I'm able to control what I want, but for tomorrow I probably have a lot of uncertainties. So with those uncertainties integrated into my control, would help I design better control. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is from someone who left their name is Xi. Um, I wonder how different temporal scales of the urban climates, subdiurnal, diurnal, seasonal, annual, etc., should be taken into account for the feedback control that is needed for optimization of the urban complex system. Are there certain temporal scales that are the most relevant? Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, I think that I would say, uh, if you think about design, I, I really don't think you need very high resolution. Um, so it's uh, sizing. So that typically, um, our, uh, our resolution of hour is, is sufficient. Um, then when you come to the control, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, okay, the design, for the design side, seasonal, I know is also important, right? That's how the switch system from heating to cooling. Um, also, yeah, I want to mention another important trend in, in, in the building industry is that, oh, in the entire energy industry, we talk about electrification, right? We, we heard of that. So electrification is good to, so when you're trying to, you know, um, do the, de for the decarbonization. But the challenge comes out that, think about, Boulder, like I say, you know, we live in Boulder, we know in the winter we all sometimes have the snow, sun and income, then we have power outage, right? So what's gonna happen if you have no power and all your heatings come from electricity? That, that's, so right now, we, I have natural gas at home. So, right, that can, it can be a, a e big issue, right? So then, it's, we need to design a system to consider that. Uh, and also, you need to replace the heating by, by using the heat pump system, right? Then the significant capacity increase for your electric grids. And so, again, knowing the future weather, the signal change helps a lot. Um, so another trend in our industry is also, you know, you can use thermal storage or geothermal. Um, so in the summer, you dump the heat to the ground, in the winter, you take the heat out, right? So, so that you can have a balance. Then if you cannot predict this seasonal change correctly, you're going to overheat your ground or overcool your ground so that the ground source system is not going to work or the efficiency is going to reduce. Again, so those things are very important for the design of the system. And then we will have to control, again, so I would say, really um, 10 to 15 minutes typically um, is sufficient for most temperature control, but PV is a different story. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions in the room yet? Or, um, I guess I have another question. So when you're, um, you were showing basically, you know, the, the cost savings from different scenarios, uh, were you assuming, or, and also then a scenario where you were trying to minimize CO2 emissions based on the mix of energy generation throughout the day and throughout the year. Um, in those scenarios, did you keep the, the price of energy constant or um, have you investigated um, incorporating 
time of day usage and trying to basically co-balance CO2 emission reduction and price at the same time, or, yeah? Yes, this is a very good question. Um, actually, we, um, yeah, we did quite a few different work on, on that. So one is trying to uh, study the different pricing schemes, right? For example, constant price, time of use price, uh, or um, high demand price, or even fake renewable energy price. And so then to evaluate what will be the cost of building retrofits, uh, or the benefits. And we just published another journal paper, uh, I think last week. Um, so this is a journal work with Professor Chuan He at the Business School of Seal Boulder. And to integrate the carbon price. So right now in the US, you know, some states and cities are actually having the carbon, carbon price involved, you know, carbon, or carbon trade credits. In European Union, it's about $50 per ton right now. So um, we, we started that if I'm able to claim carbon credits for, from my building control or retrofits, so what will be the change to my return on investment of any decisions? Um, yeah, we found a very interesting results. Um, so that, that's something I was just published recently. And all the papers are available at my lab website. I think, yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating areas in this. Um, you know, back in early June, there was um, ESIG, the Energy Systems Integration Group, held a meteorology and market design workshop in Denver uh, that I attended. And while they weren't, they're looking more at it from kind of from the utility side and also, um, you know, managing loads and control and and mm -hmm. controls for uh, for the grid. I think this definitely feeds into a lot of those issues too, and they and they see that and recognize that. So I, I think there's some rich areas for collaboration here between atmospheric scientists and building engineers and um, power system operators and utilities, and they all need to be talking to each other. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we definitely need to, need to be keeping the conversation going and, and seeking out ways that we can be collaborating and, and helping with this. And speaking for myself, I'm definitely interested in this because I do a lot of renewable energy forecasting research specifically. But um, thinking also in the climate space, um, I think for you know to, to right size, you know what, you know what battery, how much PV do you put, you know on roofs or, uh, you know any of those things for for future climate. I mean that adds obviously another layer of uncertainty, with the caveat that hopefully wouldn't be changing that much in the ten to twenty year time frame. Um, more as you go out further out, obviously, but. Um, yeah, just my, my, my brain is thinking, the, the wheels are turning right now. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Anything online, Jenny? All right, so I think we'll, I think we'll wrap it up now. So uh, once again, thank you, Wangda, for uh, just a fascinating seminar. Um, thanks for those of you online as well for um, contributing your questions. And um, so, Wangda, how long will you how long will you be you know in the area and or or at NCAR? Uh, I'm moving in August to Penn State, uh, but I, I can I still have project with CEO Boulder, so I will I have some of my students stay at CEO Boulder. I'm going to graduate them here, so I will come more often. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, feel free to you know, reach out to Wangda directly. You see his uh, email address there on the screen. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you back for uh, future seminars, even remotely, or uh, fut future visits here too with uh, collaboration with us. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Wangda.